right here. You know what, church? We are really, really in for a treat today. One of my dear friends and one of the greatest teachers I feel in the world is going to come to the stage where I'm standing right now. This man has birthed more churches than anybody I know, thousands and thousands of churches all over the world. And he is in demand everywhere, and we are just blessed to be able to have him come today and share. This is one of the great friends I have. Matter of fact, when I came here and I was praying about coming to Modesto, this is the pastor friend I sat down and talked to and asked his advice and share with him, and he said to go. So church, this is the man that told me to come here, so I know you're going to love him. Welcome, Pastor Larry Stockstill. All right, all right, all right. Come on, let's give Jesus a great hand clap today. Amen. Wow, thank you, thank you. You may be seated. Uh, such a blessing to be with you guys, just to see Pastor Glenn Berto's face. How many of you love Glenn and Deborah? Come on now. You know, I just uh, was here a couple years ago with your men, had a great time with them, and just seeing what God has done here after that conversation he and I had over lunch uh, at least 25 years ago, and the Holy Spirit spoke through me and said, Glenn, you should go to Modesto. And, and then when I first came to Modesto, I thought, wow, what, what a miracle, what God has done here. We're very excited to be with you uh, this morning. How many of you believe that Mike Trenton is about to get saved in this service? He's... That guy is so on fire for God. Give him a hand clap. He's, he's just amazing. He's so, come on, say fire. Say a little fire. And I just, you know, you got to like anybody who's got dimples. Isn't that right? That's what my mama told me. But he's just, just such, a, such a blessing. And uh, I know that Pastor Deborah has a great ministry on Monday nights. It's like nothing I've seen in the United States. I'm on Dr. Cho's board. I've seen it in Korea. I've seen other places. But in America, I've never seen seven or 800 people coming together on a Monday night for prayer. And I know this month you are fasting uh, in whatever way you can. You know, some of you are Purean steaks. I know they, they say anything to get up a straw is legal. Come on, right? <laughs> I have to say this, I thought about it while I was down there. Uh, you, my first fast years ago, I thought I was going to die, to be honest. And it had been going like seven days, and I, I looked like a refugee from a concentration camp. I mean, I looked bad. I got in Walmart, and I'm, I'm so hungry, I, I, I don't know what to do with myself. And I heard over this loudspeaker, it said, uh, shoppers, we have hot biscuits in the garden department. And I mean, I could. J How many of you love a hot biscuit? Raise your hand. Well, some of you don't even know what that is. You need to come on down south and learn how to eat every now and then. So this hot, I, I, all I could get, and I thought, I have to have one. I mean, I love a hot biscuit with butter and jelly and all that on it. So I made my way to the garden department. I was giving in. That's it. A break in the pan. I said, ma'am, where, where are the hot biscuits? And she looked at me so funny, and I said, no, I just heard it over the loudspeaker. And she said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, well, you just made an announcement. She said, no. I said, shoppers, we have hibiscus in the garden department. <laughs> anyway, I don't know why that came back to me while I was sitting there just thinking about you. But hey, we love you. We love you with all of our heart. We love Pastor Glenn and Deborah. We just, we love their integrity. We love the voice of this, uh, of this house going now all over the nation with Micah in Fort Worth and so much is going on. I have a word, I believe the Holy Spirit gave me for you in this 30 days of vision. And it was confirmed when I got here. I didn't even know why the Lord told me to speak it. But I'm gonna deal this morning on how to heal your relationships, every relationship in your life. I'd like to just take a moment and read from 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 11, we're going to put that up on the screen. And God, this 30 days, God can do amazing things in your marriage, with your children, with somebody that's causing a problem in your life. God can do amazing things during a season of fasting and prayer. Can you say amen to that? 
We know he can do financial miracles. He can do physical miracles. But now we're talking today about relational miracles and breakthroughs that are coming. Even in heaven's gates and hell's flames, you're going to see some miracles happen. But in the latter part of 2 Corinthians 13, actually the last three verses, Paul said this, finally, brothers, rejoice. And then here's a phrase I love, aim for restoration. Now we can just stop right there. That's a great message. Aim for restoration. That the bullseye of life when it comes to how we treat each other is we're aiming for the healing and restoration. And that word literally means to reset a broken arm. That's what it means, or a broken bone. Comfort one another. This is some ways you do it. Agree with one another. I like that. And boy, in America today, we've never had such division and strife and homes broken and split right down the middle over all kinds of issues. Social media, my God. Some of you are so much into Facebook, you need to get your face in the book again. Come on now. He said, and live in peace. That's my intention. I'm going to live in peace with people. I'm going to walk in the principles I'm going to teach you today. And the God of love and peace. I love that name for God. The God, say that out loud. The God of love and peace. It's just a great description. We'll be with you. And then he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. And we don't do that in our culture. I was in uh, Romania years ago as a college student in an underground church, and they, uh, th uh, this man walked up and just kissed me right on the cheek, and I stepped back and said, back off, dude, or I'm going to cut you. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that's their culture. But greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The, here's my theme. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, that's the Father. So we got Jesus giving grace. We got the Father giving love. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Father, we thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We welcome you here, Holy Spirit. There are relationships that need to be healed. There's work that needs to be done in our families, in our friendships. There are things that you alone can heal, hearts that have become hardened even years and decades ago that you must melt and turn back to us. We thank you for miracles in our relationships in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Now, I want to give you just a short little story about how important it is for us to walk in restoration. Years ago, my wife gave me a, this German watch. I don't have it on today, this Apple watch, but... My wife gave me this German watch for Christmas, and I found out later she paid $800 for it, which I would have never let her do that, but she saved up her money, and it for 10 years, this awesome watch. Love it. It sets itself uh, by a tower in Boulder, Colorado. It's a radio watch. It's controlled by that. So it's, it's never been one second off. It's just perfect because this tower is beeping out uh, radio frequency, and it picks that up, and it just it's fabulous. Then it's solar powered, so I never had to wind it, never had to put a battery. So basically for 10 years I did nothing. Well, I went to Japan two years ago, Japan, Malaysia, and the Philippines for 19 days. When I arrived in Japan, I looked at my watch and I saw the hands moving 14 hours ahead. That's how far Japan time is ahead of us because there's another tower in Japan. It picked up that signal and automatically set to Japan time for the whole 19 days, which is very cool. Yeah. So when I flew back in here to San Francisco, I, you know, I looked down at my watch, I thought well, I was gonna pick up the tower in Boulder, Colorado. Well, it didn't. And it stayed 14 hours ahead. I didn't even know how to set the thing. It's an automatic everything, you know, with air conditioning too. No, not really. So I, I flew on home to Baton Rouge, no change. Two days go by, the watch still stayed on Japanese time. In other words, my body came home, but my watch's heart stayed in Japan. Well, I just, you know, I got, I got nervous about it. I went online, I downloaded a booklet, nothing changed. I called people, I, I, everything. I called the factory, I, no change. After six long weeks of trying to get this watch to go back to American time, I told Melanie, I'm done. I'm going to throw this thing away. I said, she says, why? I said, love, I can't look at my watch every time and deduct 14 from it. I can't do that. 
and it was just worthless. I didn't want it to just sit there, so I gave it one more day. Everybody say one more day. That's a prophetic word for somebody in here. You got tired of this relationship with somebody. You think it's over. You can't. And, and God's saying, come on now, there's just one more day. And you needed to come to this service to find out how God can change every relationship. So I called this one last guy. And he said, what direction is the window that you're putting in? You have to put it in a window to charge it because it goes by the sun and, and or light and, and all. I said, well, I don't know. It's facing east. He said, no, dummy. He said, Colorado's not east of you. It's west. Put it in a western window, and it will reset. It will find the tower. So I set it in the windowsill. I told him, I'm going to give it this weekend. I went and preached. I came back. Couldn't wait to get there. Went in there, picked up my watch, and booyah. Come on now. It was perfect. Absolutely perfect. It's been perfect now for two years. That, that watch has not lost a second. I was about to throw away something that actually was just facing the wrong tower. I'm coming. I'm coming. And God spoke to me. This is for you. There's nothing wrong with people. It's sin in their lives. They are facing the wrong tower. They're facing the world, the culture of sin, the family background they came out of. They're facing temptations and demon spirits that they deal with on Monday night here of freedom addictions. They're, people are flawed because of darkness, because of the devil. They're facing the wrong tower. They're getting all their signals, and that's why their whole face of their life is set toward that time. They can't help it. But all I had to do was move the watch from one tower to the other side. I just had to turn that watch. And if we get the word repentance means to turn. If we can just help that person by the grace of God to turn toward the other tower, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. And look at him on the cross and see him dying in the suffering of his own blood and and turn their life there, their mind there, their body there. Everyone in the wilderness that was bitten by a serpent, the moment they looked at that serpent on the pole, they were instantly healed. We just have to turn them toward the right tower. I got people in my church, man, they, they were so, they were lost as a goose in a hailstorm. That's the way we call it. I'm talking about lost. And God turned them around. I could give you testimony after testimony. In fact, I'm looking at some of you. Yeah. Such yeah. were some of you. You were so lost, pointing the wrong direction, and God turned you around. How many of you remember the day you turned toward the right tower? You remember that? And those hands started moving. <laughs> and you felt, and, and people don't understand. We just on a different time zone. We're, we're operating in a heavenly dimension. So let me just... Let me refer, refer to this verse again, this last verse. Paul said, aim for restoration, and he gave you three secrets contained in this verse. You may have missed it when you just read 100 miles an hour. He said, the love of God the Father, the Message Bible says, now may the, uh, the uh, extravagant love of God the Father and the amazing grace of Jesus and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That's how we know Paul was from the South. Because he said, you all, right? Yeah, that's not true. That, that, that's not a biblical principle. But look at, the, look at the way the message translation, and, and I love those three words. If you could keep them up there for me, I'm going to analyze them just a moment. Then we're going to apply them in five areas of your life. Your, your first secret of restoration is God's extravagant love, extravagant. And what we mean by that is, is his covenant love. Our love is sort of based on performance. Our love is based upon convenience, convenient friendships. Rather than God's love, which is based upon covenant and faithfulness. It's, it's an automatic thing. God's love is an amazing love. 
In fact, the scripture has a word for it called hesed, H-E-S-E-D in Hebrew. It's used 275 times in the Old Testament. It's the number one theological term in the Old Testament. There's no term used more than that. And it describes a covenant relationship like David had with Jonathan. They, they walk together as they, their covenant love, their relationship. And when you come to the love of God, it says that his love is not like a drop or a drip or a trickle or a creek or a stream or even an ocean. The love of God is described in the Psalms as being higher than the highest heavens. That's the whole universe that tells me his love fills the entire universe. You could go a trillion miles and his love is still out there. It fills it, but it cannot get to this earth without a spigot, and that spigot is you and me. When we allow this extravagant love of God the Father to flow through us, it can show itself to any human being, regardless of what they look like, talk like, or smell like. It doesn't matter, any of that. The love, the extravagant love of God, and He loves you. He made you for a purpose. You're a child that He has given birth to. He loves you. And, and you know, somebody thinks, well, we're just a product of evolution. No, we're not. It's not from the goo to you by way of the zoo. Is that right? God knows you. God loves you. He made you. The second term that you must remember, once you get the love of God, is the amazing grace of Jesus. That describes what he did when he left heaven. That's grace. Came to earth. That's grace. Baptized in water. That's grace. Filled with the Spirit. Went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of demons, cast 6,000 demons out of one man into a bunch of pigs, and they ran into the sea. Somebody said he made the first deviled ham. Isn't that right? Oh, that's good. And then he raised Lazarus from the dead, healed 10 lepers, but fed 5,000, walked on water. It's all grace. He filled Peter's boat with fish. Jesus Christ, the amazing grace, but his greatest act of grace, of course, was when he went to the cross and was nailed for you and for me and blood shed for our sins to be forgiven. The amazing grace. We'll see it in the drama next week. But we come to that third one. Once you get his love, God loves me. God, God loves me endlessly if I'll receive it. Secondly, Jesus loves and gave his life for me and forgave me. And thirdly, I can have friendship with the Holy Spirit. Once I'm saved, once I'm forgiven, the Holy Spirit will come to live in me. Now, if you take those three principles, love, grace, and fellowship or friendship, and you apply them to every relationship that's broken in your life. And I've been working on this for a year or two. You get on airplanes, man, it's dog eat dog. It, it's, it, it ain't easy traveling across America. People are mad. People, people will fight each other over the overhead bin, brothers and sisters. I mean, it's getting serious out there. So the Lord showed me, he says, you can heal your nation. And with Martin Luther King Day tomorrow, I'm just thinking of his vision of what he wanted America to look like and how far we are from that at this moment. It's never been further from that. How many of you believing for a miracle in our nation to bring us back together again? All we got to do is follow these three principles. Now, number one, let's look at our relationship to God. I'm going to put a bullseye up here on the screen because this is an Olympic bullseye, white, black, blue, red, and gold. That's what they see down the archery trail once they, once they get ready to win the gold medal. And those five rings represent the five most important relationships in your life. We're going to take those three words, love, grace, and friendship, and we're going to make those change. Now, let's start with what I consider to be the very center of the bullseye. I know you can guess this, but your most important relationship in your life is with God himself. So let's put that on the little bullseye there. Your relationship with God actually sets up every other relationship. My daddy used to tell me he'd marriage counsel people, and he'd say, listen, if you both get your relationship vertically right with God, your relationship horizontally will work out automatically. Amen. Amen. 
so you start with God. It's, 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 it's almost, it's ridiculous, it's ludicrous to think that you can fix relationships without fixing your first relationship with God. One thing I've learned is that every relationship in your life depletes you eventually. There's only one that renews you, and that's when you spend time alone with God. They that wait upon the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. Now, I love to pray in the mornings. I know some of you pray as you sleep, but you know, late now, lay me down to sleep. That's your prayer life. That, that, that's not what I do. I have to start in the morning, and I ask God to wake me up early, and he does. I don't set an alarm. He just kind of nudges me. And let, let me tell you, by, by the way, angels don't carry me to a place of prayer every morning. I do have to get up out of the bed. It's kind of like working out at the gym. I found out the most difficult machine in the health club. You know what that is? It's the front door. That's right. So I'm not saying that, you know, you can just, God's going to bring you to a place of prayer. But what has happened to me in this last two years is I've taken those three words, the love of the Father, the grace of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and I've made that my pattern of prayer. I want to challenge you to do that. Now, you may pray through the Lord's Prayer. You may do the Jabez Prayer. You may, there's a lot of patterns that people use. But I want to just challenge you. Maybe the rest of this month, when you do your prayer time, you can do this in your commute. You can do it anywhere. But I encourage you to do it alone with God like I did in my hotel right here in Modesto this morning. God woke me up about 430. And I had the most wonderful time with the Lord. You say, how long you go? I ain't going to tell you how long I went. This, this is what I did, though. I started with the Father, and I just praised him for all of his love for me. Psalm 103, forgives all my iniquities, heals all my diseases, redeems my life from destruction, crowns me with loving kindness, and satisfies my mouth with good things. I took time with the Father, just blessing him for his love, and then I moved to Jesus, and I spent time talking about his grace and all that he did for me on the cross and at the whipping post and the crown on his head, and Jesus and I spent time together about his forgiveness for me, and then I went to the the Holy Spirit and I invited his fruit into my life and, and his gifts into my life and those seven lamps Isaiah saw of the Spirit of God and, and I just had a relationship. You see this, this is how I've been praying and it's fantastic for me. I encourage you to do that because once you get your relationship with God right, then you're ready and that would be like Daniel. He opened the, the, the window three times a day and he turned toward Jerusalem. You're really turning from the world world's tower. And by the way, I don't read news first. I don't look at Facebook first or at, at emails or texts. I never look at anything of the world before I look into the face of God. I'm turning to his tower early in the morning and he resets and recalibrates my life and I'm ready to go. It doesn't matter what happens during the day. I keep the joy of the Lord. I keep the fire of the Holy Spirit because I had my altar with the Lord in the morning. Oh, you know, I feel the anointing of the Spirit of God on you. Lift up your hands right now. I want to pray for God to help your prayer life in the rest like Pastor Deborah's asking you to do. Thank you, Lord, for the spirit of love from God the Father, the spirit of grace from Jesus, and the spirit of intimacy with the Holy Spirit coming upon every member of this church this month in Jesus' name. Come on, clap your hands if you believe it today. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, number two relationship, I'm going to put it on the bullseye, is first God and then your spouse. And by the way, my beautiful, darling, gorgeous wife, Melanie, I've been married to her 42 years. That's right. That's getting weird these days when you tell somebody you've been married that long, but my daddy was married 63 years to my beautiful mother. And, I, and it's a blessing. 42 years, we just, we just getting started. And we have six beautiful children. Someone said, man, you must love to have kids. No, I love my wife. That's why I got six kids. But let me tell you something. What a blessing. She, she homeschooled them all. She's, she just, I can't tell you. And I look at Deborah Berto and I see Melanie all over again. The, the spirit of prayer was on her. The spirit of the prophetic was on her. All of those 
wonderful thing. How many of you appreciate a pastor's wife in a house that is in leadership? Come on now. My darling, we have 13 grandbabies now. I mean, we're not just pro-life. We're prolific, brother. We're we putting them out. we multiplying like rabbits now. Yesterday, she babysat two all day long. She's just unbelievable. Here's what I've learned is that the th same three principles apply to your marriage. If you're having issues in your marriage, maybe your partner is just facing the wrong tower. They may not even ever have been saved, or maybe they, maybe they woke up grumpy and they, they, they just, you know, got all upset about a news story or something. They just need to turn back to the right time. But these three principles is how you do that. So first of all, love in a marriage is not based upon feeling. It's based upon covenant. When I got married to Melanie, that beautiful lady, I sang while she was coming down the aisle. I sang a song to her. Brother, I was 23, she was 21. We left for Africa two weeks later. We were missionaries in West Africa to almost two years together out in the middle of nowhere, no electricity, no running water. I mean, that's a woman of God right there. And, and I'm, I'm in covenant with her. We may have a disagreement. We may not have a, a great morning. One morning we kind of get off to the wrong foot. But it has absolutely nothing to do with our covenant, bro. We are in this for the lifetime. That's right. In fact, I told Melanie, hey, sweetheart, if you leave me, I'm going with you. We joined at the hip. She can't get away from me. And me neither. And then to love, quit thinking about do I love her or do I not. That, you decided that years ago. You said, well, she don't look as good as she used to. Well, have you looked at yourself lately, brother? You can't, I'm coming, my, you can't even see your shoes anymore. Come on now. And then, the, it, if you get the first part right, the Hesed love, covenant love, not convenient friendship, we don't have disposable relationships, then moves the grace part, and that's forgiveness. And let me tell you, if you get the love part right, then the grace part is, you know, I know I'm going to displease you. Please forgive me. And I forgive you. You're going to have a school of character. Marriage is the school of character. Where God uses another person like a smooth stone to rub you and change you from a sharp stone to a smooth stone. David used smooth stones. God can't use you till you're smooth. And brother, he will use your spouse to give you feedback. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, you say, well, my wife, I don't like what you, well, she told you that your breath would kickstart a 747 aircraft. She's the only one that loves you enough to tell you that feedback, come on, say feedback. feedback. Your, your spouse has the courage to tell you things that other people will not tell you. And that's going to require grace. And I will admit, men and women are different. I know that our modern the uh, thinking is that no, we're the same. Uh, that, you know that uh, men are not even supposed to open the door for a woman, or it's microaggression. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. But right. well, let me just talk to you a minute because we are different. You know, I heard about a man whose wife went to Europe on a vacation with her girlfriends, and they got over there, and she was calling him every day. He was watching the house and everything, and she calls and how's everything going? He says it's going fine. She said, well, what's going on around that? Oh, nothing, not a whole lot. She said, well, how's my cat doing? He said, well, I meant to tell you that. Your cat died. <laughs> and the lady dropped the phone. He could hear her screaming and crying. My cat died. She picked up the phone, and then she got mad at him for telling her. And she said, why did you tell me my cat was dead? He said, well, it is dead. I, what else am I supposed to say? She said, you could have told me the cat got up on the roof. And then when I called from London, you could have said the cat got over in a tree. I can't get it down. And when I got to New York, you could have said the cat fell out of the tree and I had to bring it to the vet. And then when I landed in Denver and came home, you could have put your arms around me and squeezed me real hard, put my head on your chest and said, my love, the cat has deceased. He said, well, I didn't know the protocol. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then she said, so, so how's mama doing? 
He said, she's up on the roof. You're going to need grace. <laughs> I mean, I don't like it when Melody corrects my driving. How many of you men would say a big amen right there? I need grace, man. I always, I look over, I say, whose hands is this wheel in? But I need grace. We, you, you're going to have to have grace on a daily basis. And then comes, what's our third term? Friendship, fellowship, intimate friendship. That has to be built over a lifetime. Now, we have it in our morning routine. We wake up together. Usually the Lord wakes me up much earlier than her. I pray she gets up. We go make coffee. You know, you ain't saved till you get a cup of coffee. Isn't that right? We go in our bedroom. We sit in the same two chairs, and we face each other, and we talk about the day. We talk about our kids. We talk about life. We talk about the Lord. We talk about whatever. We give each other the first 45 minutes, sometime longer, to with each other, then we go eat breakfast together, then I go do my walk, two and a half miles, she does hers, and, and, and then we're kind of off to the races, but we've prioritized each other before anybody else, because she really is that important in my life, more important than anyone else, and then thirdly is this, your, your kids, I'm just putting these up quickly for you, your children, now, first you get God, then you get your spouse, and now comes the next important thing to you is not your boss or your hunting buddy. The next important relationship in your life, I believe, are your children. And I'm looking now at an amazing thing. I don't know if you guys have a picture of my family. It's somewhere I sent it to them, and maybe up there they have it. Let's give them just a second, see if they can find it. And if they can't, I'll keep on going. That's just me. Okay. Well, anyway, I have six children. They're all married. There they are. There we go. Now, I got five boys. You, you see my five big old boys in front. My son-in-law is kind of in the back between two of them, holding one. And then there's my beautiful daughters-in-law, Janae and Miriam. And, and then I got Melissa. That's my daughter. I got Megan. I got Amy. And, and then all 13 grandchildren. There they are. And that, now you talk about priority. What else should I priority? Who, who, Brunhilde Hucklemeister didn't get my time ahead of those people right there. That, that's what I'm talking about. So what do you, how do you repair a relationship with a child? One of those, I'm not going to tell you which one, got away from the Lord when they were a teenager. At a Christian school, they met two kids that were not serving God. And I mean, when I looked up, it's my fault. I had to be too busy to not see it. But he was, he was away from God and, and running around with all kind of stuff with those boys. And it took me five years to get him back. I mean, he got into trouble. He got into everything you can imagine. But God brought him back. We continued to pray, and, and we applied these three principles. Now, I don't know who is here that you've got a child away from God. Nothing will break your heart like that. But after five years, the Holy Spirit brought him back. In fact, he got back in college. He made nothing but straight A's in college, 4.0, the last three years of his college, after he got right with God, went and got his master's degree, passed the CPA exam with a 95. He was in the top 1% of the United States scoring on the CPA exam. He's now married to a beautiful psalmist in our church. They have two kids. He's the CFO of our church. I love him. He's my fishing buddy. Come on, God can do miracles in a family. But what I'm saying is that they need the same three principles. Number one, they need love. And that love comes as something you may not know. It's affirmation. Affirmation is when you tell a child, I love you. You know how many kids have not heard that come out of their parents' mouth in years? I love you. And I'm proud of you. Just like God said to Jesus when he was baptized in water, God said, you are my son whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. We must commit and speak affirmation over them and then love is also quality time with them. You cannot say I love you if you have no time for the things they want to do in their life. That's a family night every week. I would do that. Monday night was ours, pop popcorn, wrestle on the floor, play chase, watch a movie, 
wrestle, whatever you can do, but you gotta, you're showing them that you love them. That's number one, extravagant love for them. And then grace, they are going to do things that will get on your last nerve, trust me. But when that prodigal son, like my son that got away from God, when he took his money and went over the hill and disappeared for a few years, that father was ready, and when he came back, he didn't say, you sorry outfit, you, you stole all of our money, you rested, you, you wasted it. He, he ran, and he fell on his neck, and the Bible says he hugged and kissed him. That is forgiveness. You're going to have to have the opportunity in your life to forgive your children. But I love the last one, intimate friendship. Once they know you love them, once they realize you're willing to forgive them and be gracious, then you must develop a deeper relationship with them. And now my children are my best friends. My son has taken our church seven years ago, and he is my pastor. I mean, I whipped his rear end at least 200 times in his life. And by the way, intimate fellowship, if we got into a Piccadilly cafeteria, one of them was throwing peas at the other one. I'd call their name, and I have a talent one of my eyebrows can go up with the other one staying flat. It's like that. And I'd say, Jonathan. And he'd look and I'd, I would do that. And that meant that if you don't cease in your operation and desist in your maneuver, there won't be enough comic books to put in the seat of your britches when I apply the Board of Education to the seat of higher learning. That's all in that eyebrow right there. We could call it a time of fellowship. How many of you have had a time of fellowship with your children before? And that, that intimate friendship, but I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that right now, all six of mine are married. They're all either in business or ministry. Uh, five are full-time ministry. One's in business. He opened his own business. My youngest, doing amazing. But that, these three principles, that's, that's all you need. So let's move to number four. I'm just touching on these. I can't really extensively preach them, but here to me is the fourth most important relationship in your life, and that is a smaller group of Christians that you become intimately connected with. I like what Andy Stanley said. He said we need circles and not just rows. We're in rows right now. You're facing me and you're sitting at the back of someone's head. You're looking at it. That's good. We feel the energy of being together. They were all together in one place, all in one accord. But when we gather into a circle, we're not looking at the back of our heads. We're looking at faces. We're looking at people that we begin to connect with. The new millennial generation, connectivity and community is the most important value in their life. Because all they ever saw was the back of their parents walking out the door to go to work or go somewhere else. They're longing for a face, a person. And I've discovered that actually everyone is. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, realized that he'd won 60,000 people to Christ, but they had no relationship. This is in the 1700s. And he put them all in a life group, in a small group, weekly. And each person went around the room and told the state of their soul and the scripture they used to get out of temptation that week. And they did that once a week and they punched their ticket. And if they didn't have 11 out of 13 weeks attendance in that life group, he said, you can't be a Methodist next quarter. That guy was ruthless, man. Yeah, yeah. We're not going to do that. But what we see is that he ended his lifetime with 10,000 life groups and all 60,000 of those Methodists in England were in them. He had the strongest thing ever built up until this century. Let me talk to you about the importance of that relationship. Remember our principles. Number one is I need someone in my life. You may not need them now, but when something happens, a death, a sickness a tragedy, and you don't even know who to contact. That's when we realize that we need someone who comes into a covenant relationship with us, that we know them and they know us face to face. They even know our weaknesses. That's the grace part. 
Love is the commitment part. Grace is it. You know what? None of us are perfect. If, if, if there was a magnifying glass on me, you would know that I have this area I'm working in and that area. God's not finished with me yet. How about you? You know, you've heard about geese. They fly in flocks, you know, to increase their velocity by 70%. You've heard that, all this is. And there's one line that's longer than the other side in the V. Do you know why that is? Because there's more geese on that side than the other one. <laughs> I'm just checking there. Y'all alive? Wait, wait, wait. There. And you know what they do? They honk. Do you know why they honk? You've read this. It's, it's because... They get tired and the one behind them will honk at them to encourage them. So just go ahead and just honk at somebody next to you. Go ahead. Just, that's a honk if you love Jesus. Hey, but here's my point. If one goose is shot or gets sick and falls out of the flock, what are they going to do? Do they just say, well, Henry, it's been real. That's what we do in church. The person disappears. We didn't, nobody ever even asks where they are. But, but when they're in a circle that's looking at faces, somebody says, there's that chair. Where, where's Henry? What, what's going on? Two geese leave the V and follow down to that goose that falls to the ground for whatever reason. And at a distance, they watch it until it dies or recovers. And if it recovers, they wait for the next flock flying overhead and the three of them fly up and rejoin the next group going on overhead. If we had as much sense as a goose, we would put ourselves in teams, in relational teams that keep us all protected. And I've seen it happen with men so often. But the last term, again, would be first love, then grace. But what's, what's, the, what's the third part? Intimate friendship. And that means that we're going to do life together. We're going to become best friends. We're going to watch the game tonight together and you know I'm from New Orleans and y'all are from California who's going to win tonight I don't know it depends on whose prayers reach heaven the most I guess but I, I'm sure if Los Angeles wins then it just tells me that God doesn't care about football but if the saints win we know his perfect will has been done come on right but we need, we need that intimate friendship together because that's how we work together. You know, our small groups don't just meet. They have projects. They go out. They feed the poor. They, they have clothing giveaways. They go to best outside of shopping centers to give away water. They, they win souls together. They work together. And did you know that a Belgian horse, one Belgian horse can pull 8,000 pounds? One, the strongest horse in the world. But if, it, if there's two Belgian horses, do a little math. Come on, Jethro Bodine. How many pounds would that be? One can pull 8,000. How many pounds could two horses pull? 16, right? At least. Because when it's two, it goes up to 24,000 pounds. So that's synergy. It's not just what one can do, but when they combine, it goes to 24,000. But if they've known each other for a while and developed a relationship, that goes up to 32,000 pounds. Two horses, not 16, 32,000 pounds. The world's record of Belgian horses, I got this from Dave Ramsey. He did all the research. The world's record of two Belgian horses that knew each other their whole lifetime. You know what it was? 52,000 pounds. That's you and a friend. How can two walk together except they be agreed? Two are better than one, Ecclesiastes said, for if one fall, they need each other to pick themselves up. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. Pastor Glenn is sowing vision of life groups because in today's crazy world, number one, we need connection. Number two, we need forgiveness. But number three, we can accomplish a lot more as a circle than a row. Come on, say amen to that. Here's my last point, an extended family. Now we're coming to heaven's gates and hell's flames. How many of you have a lost person in your family? Raise, raise up your hand. Okay, most of us do. 
Most of us do. The same three principles will work for aunts, uncles, cousins, in-laws, outlaws. Number one, you got to love them unconditionally. Number two, you got to forgive them. And I don't know what your family was like over Christmas, but we had a whole lot of opportunities to forgive some folks. And number three, you're going to need to get together with them and build intimate friendship. By month. Now, our family's all eating together today. My son caught a bunch of fish at the coast, and they're having a big fish fry today. Every Sunday, 27 of us get together. Melanie cooks enchiladas, roast rice, gravy, red beans, and rice. Come on, somebody. Come on. And we're building intimate fellowship. That's the secret. But I want to just mention this. I had a Muslim man move in next door to me. The only family, I believe, in my little community of Baker that was Muslim. They moved in right next door to me. I've been there 36 years. And when he bought this home and had some property, he built a fence all the way around, a six-foot fence, and put tires up against the fence on the inside. Our little police force thought he's from Yemen. They thought that he was a terrorist, maybe. I mean, he looked the part. He never smiled. He never said one word for three years to anybody in our neighborhood. He had two women, and, and they were both his wives. They had, both had kids. And, and, and they, we never saw them. They were inside this compound. Nobody went in. Nobody went out. If anybody ever went in, the only thing they ever heard from him was, don't ever go near my compound again. That's all we heard. And I'm talking about just normal suburbia America. The police threw drones overhead and all that, trying to see what's going on with all the tires and everything. They never could figure it out. Well, then our, our area flooded. If you remember two years ago, Baton Rouge was completely flooded with a tropical storm. Our neighborhood flooded. Every house on the street flooded except mine. I live on the end of the street. I, I guess a little elevation difference. So I was out of town preaching in Austin. My sons took our little boat and rescued people out of their homes. And this man and his two families were in their house, and that water was about three or four feet. They were perishing. So the gate blew open. The flood blew the gate open. And my, my son brought his boat up in there, rescued them, one family at a time, got them onto the main street, and then they, we got transportation, and they brought them somewhere. I, I was so busy, I, that was all we did. His wife came out about a month later, please, please come. So my wife and I, we go inside the compound. You know, I mean, we, we, I mean, I had peace be steel only, you know. <laughs> and the, dad, the husband was not there. He had had to go find work somewhere. And she said, uh, my lawnmower's broken through her little daughter interpreting. And so a friend of mine came over. We got the lawnmower fixed. Then she said, my hot water heater's broken. We went in there. Another plumber friend of mine came, fixed the hot water. Then said, my air conditioner's broken. Another friend of mine. So in about two or three hours, we had all of our systems up and running. We were just showing the love of God. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm applying this somewhere. A month went by, and we got a phone call one day from the lady, this little girl, spoke English, and she put the man on the line. And he said, my name is Mike. He said, you fixed my hot water heat my air conditioner, and my lawnmower. And I didn't know what he was going to say after that. He said, thank you. I owe you some money. I said, no, Mike, you don't owe me anything. I love you. And he got quiet. I said, you're my neighbor, and I honor you. Anything you need, the answer is yes. Everything changed, my brothers and sisters. Everything changed. They came out. They started going up the street. We started eating with them. And, and those two dear ladies called us two weeks ago. That man was killed in a convenience store robbery. The, the husband of those two families. We are reaching out to these two ladies who have children from Yemen and don't know... All because of three little principles. Close your eyes with me. If you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor, I need forgiveness. 
God loves you. Jesus died for you. And the Holy Spirit wants to live in you. He wants a relationship with you. Go back to the center of the circle. If that's you and you would say, include me in a prayer, I need forgiveness today. Here's what I want you to do without hesitation. I want you to slip up your hand right in your seat right now and hold it up high. All right, there, 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 there. I see your hands all across this room. All of you that have a hand raised, everybody else keep your heads bowed. All of you with your hand raised, step up out of your seats, the whole big group of you, and come up here. I want to pray for you. Just, just get up out of your seats. There's about 40 of you, 30 or 40 of you. Come up here quickly. You want the love of God. You want the love of God. Give them a hand clap as they come. Give them a great hand clap as they come. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I want our, our, our prayer partners to come up here and prepare yourselves. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to ask Brother Mike, come on up here with me, if you will, Brother Mike. While they're coming, this is the Holy Spirit. Everyone else stand. Now, I'm going to ask Brother Mike to lead you in a sinner's prayer, just a simple prayer. Next week is Heaven's Gates. All of you look at me. I want you to show love, grace, and friendship. you got about seven days to do it. And invite someone to come into the circle. That's your new theme. Your home, your loved, your family. Bow your heads, Brother Mike. Lead us in prayer. You're standing here all over the sanctuary. Those in the altar, I want you to put your right hand over your heart. And lift your left hand toward heaven. Because right now, this is just a time of intimacy between you and God the Father. It's all about your heart. It's all about where your heart is. Not your head today. That's where your heart is today. The Holy Spirit has spoken to you through Pastor Larry that you need the love of God. You need the grace of Christ. You need the, the intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Friendship. And that's what we can have when we know Jesus. We can have friendship with God the Father. So today as we pray this prayer together, I want you to make this commitment to God. It's not to me. It's not to this church. It's not to Pastor Larry, Pastor Glenn. It's to God. It's a covenant that you're establishing with Him. A heart covenant with God. So pray these words. Repeat these words after you. And I'm going to ask everybody in the audience to pray with us. Stretch out your hands toward these in the altar. Say this with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be in your presence this day. Today, God, I understand that I need your love I need your grace, and I need friendship with you. Right now, Lord, I confess and I acknowledge that I have sinned and fallen short. I've made mistakes. But today, Lord, I open my heart and ask you to come in. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive my transgressions. Make me a new person. Fill my heart with your love, your grace. Give me intimacy with your Holy Spirit. Today, Lord, I become a new creature in Christ. I ask you to change me. Make me new again. Help me live my life in such a way that I will glorify you in everything I do, everything I say. Today, Lord, thank you for saving me, for changing me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you give God praise this morning? Give Him praise.